Okay, so you already had my introduction. Uh, maybe I should introduce my co-author, <laughs> uh, Joachim Tag is in the Swedish School of uh, um, Economics and Business Administration, and we did um, most of this work when he was visiting um, NYU. Um, so uh, the idea of um, a two-sided market is uh, that if you have um, a, a network and you have some people out here, let's say users, who are having some services, and on the other side you have some people who will call providers. Okay. Um, the idea of uh, a two-sided market is that a network in here, let me give it a name, okay, this, just, 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 just a name. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, the, the idea um, is that this network can, um, in principle, is able to, to charge on both sides of the market, right? It can charge the users and it can charge the providers too. Um, but on the other hand, it's not obvious that it wants to do it, uh, for example, in credit card networks, if I put here the name Visa, and here we had the users, and here we had um, the merchants. Is Visa the, the network now, or is it the third party? The network, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, or MasterCard, Visa, you know, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know uh, American yeah. Express, yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, if you think of um, now under the Visa uh, setup, the merchants being there, um, Visa and, 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 and MasterCard uh, find ways to charge the merchants but subsidize the users. So although the networks have the ability to charge positive price on both sides, it's not obvious that they're going to charge positive prices. So that's kind of the very beginning of this thing. They are able to charge both, both sides. Do, we, do they really want to? That's question number one. Question number two is, well, suppose that AT&T does want to charge both sides in particular on the internet, is it a good idea for society as a whole? Is society better off if AT&T charges both providers and users or not? So this is essentially the two questions. And then there is an additional question on net neutrality. So the first question is, should they charge on this side? So the, the main question is on this side. Okay, should AT&T be allowed to charge um, providers? But then there is the additional question, should they be allowed to charge differentially? Uh, that is, should they be allowed to charge different prices or more generally discriminate between the different information packages that come through the internet, either in terms of pricing or even maybe without pricing, just, just discriminate in general, put these packets in front of somebody else's packets or, or, or not. So this is kind of the, the beginning of, 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 of net neutrality. So having said this very, very, very beginning idea, let me start by uh, talking about two-sidedness, first of all. Two-sidedness is a very common thing. Uh, you have many times, many types of goods where you have um, um, complement, complementarity. For example, you have the Adobe Acrobat distiller and, and the readers. You have advertisers and, and users uh, on the yellow pages or on, the, on Yahoo, Google, and so on. Um, in the old monopoly of AT&T, you had originating and terminating charges. Um, well, let, let, let's skip the, the finance. I mean, there are, there are in financial networks also similar things happen. Fecundo Fitzgerald is a, is, a, is, a, is a dominant firm in, in government trading, government bonds trading of the United States, and it subsidized one company, Salomon Brothers, because that company had so much, uh, so many clients. <laughs> anyway, so that's, let's skip the, the, the finance example because it's a bit far away from what we're talking about. Um, today. Now, the most um, interesting examples are the vertically disintegrated companies. The companies were not like Acrobat, which controls both the reader and the, and the, and the, um, and the distiller, but were different companies control different sides of the market, or at least you have different agents. The users and the merchants are different in the credit card network, or it, typically you know, on the internet, the users and the providers of information or the, the, the uh, providers of content are different, different people. Okay, so, and there are many such examples. Clients and service operating systems and applications, these are complementary goods. Uh, platform, game platform and games, authors and readers in, in journals. So in all these cases, the issue of pricing arises. Okay, so if you look empirically, 
about who pays whom, you see different results. For example, the operating systems like Microsoft Windows subsidize the applications that run on Microsoft Windows. Uh, the game platforms, on the other hand, uh, collect royalties from the, from the software of, of, of the games. Um, in credit cards, uh, issuers may, um, may pay users uh, and then impose the fees on the merchants. And then there are many different variations in credit cards because of this possibility of credit as well. And because in the credit cards, there is a, a more complicated setup, which I don't want to explain here in detail, but there, are, there is a there are the, the merchant and the user down here, but then there are two different banks intermediating the transaction. The transaction goes this way, and uh, the transaction goes this way. So there are four you know, merchants, users, but then there are two different types of banks here. This is the Visa network, uh, but here are the issuer bank and here is the acquirer bank. So this is a bit more complicated, but it essentially it, it's a very similar to, to other things if you abstract from the idea that there are two different banks out there and not a single one. In newspapers, traditionally, they were, they were sold at the positive price, but obviously they could go to zero price because they can make so much money from advertising. Similarly, in academic journals, uh, traditionally readers pay, uh, but experience has shown that even small fees you know, make a difference. Uh, so uh, if, if the content is completely free on the internet, it gets much, much bigger um, uh, readership. You, you know, I'm not so sure if, if when, when, when you say you read my stuff and they were great, if they, if, if they had a positive price, uh, ex ante, without knowing who I am, would you really have paid? You never know. Maybe you wouldn't. <laughs> so uh, there is this issue of, um, of, of a zero price. Now, if we're going to have a regulation, what kind of regulation should we have? Should we regulate both sides of the market? And if we're not allowed to regulate both sides of the market and we can regulate only one, what conditions apply to the other side of the market? Is the other side cost-based? Is the other side um, uh, monopolized? Or is the other side more duopoly and so on? OK, so let me tell you where this business uh, started, this idea of net neutrality. Uh, Ed Whitaker was the CEO of SBC, and then SBC acquired AT&T. Then he became the CEO of AT&T and then retired. Here is a quote from Business Week. So they asked him, look, I mean, you know, are you concerned about these companies, uh, Google, MSN, Vonage, and so on and so on. And the crucial thing that he says, well, he says, these guys want to use my network for free, and I won't let them do it. You know, that's <laughs> he says it in a way that is colloquial. You know, I, won't, I won't let them do that because they're trying to use my network for free, uh, and we have made an investment and so on, and you know, they, can, they think that they can use my price for free, and it's nuts. Okay, so, so he says, you know, uh, I have to really collect some money. Essentially, he's saying, I'm trying to collect some money from the upstream providers um, Google, MSN, Disney, and so on. Now, factually, he's wrong. I mean, both sides pay on the internet. If you have the internet up here, and then you have an ISP on this side, and an ISP on this side, Inter ISP means internet service provider, right? So you have a user here, and here you have um, a provider, let's say Google. Everyone, Google and the user pays the ISP, and the, and the ISPs pay uh, the network. So he's factually in, incorrect. So what's he talking about? He's really not talking about traditional transport costs. He's talking about getting something extra. Okay. So, so it's, that's the, the thing. Now, I, I, this is a, a bit of an empirical data. The US, and this is usually for, you know, shown to American audiences, the US is not doing well at all uh, in, um, internet penetration. This is the OECD uh, latest uh, data. And it shows a number of European and other countries uh, which are in front of the United States. And this is just OECD, so it doesn't include, for example, Hong Kong and other, play, other countries that are also in front of the, of the United States. And by the way, here you are, UK. Is that Hmm? Is that percent of the population? Um, it's percent per hundred of, I don't know if you can read it, yeah, yeah. per hundred inhabitants. So it says um, subscribers per hundred inhabitants. And you see some very 
you know, significant differences. Here, these guys are about 38% in Denmark, and if you see the United States, it's about 28%. So this is a 10% difference. There is a, a recent paper, recent, very recent, in December 2009, by Czernik, uh, Kretzmer, and, and a third and fourth guy, which I have forgotten, uh, from, from IFO Munich, Germany, which where they estimated... Um, uh, the impact on growth of internet penetration of this sort and their number, their conclusion was that a 10% difference in penetration, like the one the United States has from Denmark, uh, can lead or does lead to 0.9 to 1.5% difference in growth. Now, if you think of what this number is, it's a staggering large number. <laughs> If you think of the American GNP being 15 trillion, um, a 1% change in growth means 150 billion every year, forever, compounded extra. I mean, this is a large number, very large number. I mean, you know, trillions and trillions in, if, if you add it up all, all the way to, to infinity. So that, I mean, you know, I think this is a pretty well done paper, actually, uh, the one by, by Chernik. I mean, and uh, so these things make, make, make a difference to, to, to economic growth. And, and the UK is not really much better than the US, by the way. It's, it's, it's a difference here, although it's in rank, it looks much better. In, in practice, it's not. Um, and the OECD data is actually pretty good because it also has uh, data on uh, density of uh, population and um, um, also income. So you can see if those parameters, those variables explain what, what's going on. Uh, oh, here it is, yeah, the one with the, with the per capita GNP superimposed. So here is the US, and here is all these poorer countries here, and there, and there, which are doing um, better than the US. And of course, there's, a conver there's always a conversion type of issue, the, the, the parity of the dollar and so on, but I won't go into this in detail. Okay, now, so this is a problem. So Whitaker says we should really charge both sides. Here there is some empirical evidence that things are not doing so well in, in, in the internet penetration in the United States. And here is the reality of the internet in, in, in the present. Um, the internet was created as an end-to-end -end, uh, network with three layers. A hardware layer, a logical network, and an application or services net, uh, le network uh, level, sorry. And in, in the application, and most people just see the applications and services level and nothing else. Uh, they don't understand what's going on further and they don't need to understand. And a tremendous amount of innovation has happened at that level without people knowing how the network works further down. And that was because um, of the end to end principle that was, that was uh, um, created, it was used there. So it separates, I guess this is the, 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 the crucial phrase, the internet separates the network interoperability level from the applications level. So people don't need to know further down. Now, older networks, and some of you at my age remember older networks, <laughs> the CompuServe, uh, AT&T Mail, Prodigy, earlier, well, they were centralized networks. They, you couldn't do whatever you wanted. They would give you a dumb terminal and you would just type your stuff and that's it. And AOL would do, it would give you pictures and so on, but you couldn't really create stuff. There wasn't the possibility for innovation. So, what does AT and T want? They want, to some extent, to go to the older regime. <laughs> they want to be able to control more about what's going on, and one way to control it is to price. So, I, the way I see them is both to try to make some more money, and to also try to control it because they think over time that would help them make more money. Um, so they want to impose a positive price on the other side or the provider side of the network uh, and go closer to traditional uh, models. And it would be a sharp departure from what we have um, up to now. Let me also say that uh, the Whitaker um, remarks were not, were, coin, were not out of context, uh, a few months before his remarks, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, reclassified internet services to a classification that essentially uh, puts it out of regulatory control. 
um, the previous classification was very much like a telephone service in which uh, there are many requirements um, that are imposed, especially non-discriminatory requirements. But once the classification, reclassification happened in June 2005, then there was the possibility for, and there still is right now, for the telecom and cable companies to go away from network neutrality legally without, I without any, any, any problems, and that's when Whitaker came out and said that. Was there something, can I ask Yeah, sure. Was there yeah. something in the old model that charged providers? In the old AOL, the, the first model you described? I, I don't think that at that point in time there were independent providers. Um, the, the, AOL, you're yeah, AOL was had its own con that the uh, CompuServe, um, that that business of uh, I, 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 you know external providers didn't really didn't really exist. They were they were one company with the providers. But, so, but, but the company like uh, CompuServe could say you can be on our uh, page on our okay, yeah. So they would give certain providers the ability to be seen. Mm. And they would charge those providers for that. Well, no, I think it was just, uh, they, uh, they would do anything they could to get on that page. And so I don't know what they actually, whether they charged or... For uh, let me investigate that. I mean, I, I don't really have a full answer to that. I, because I didn't think enough about it. Uh, and I, I don't know much, you know. I was yeah, okay. curious because you said you were going back. Let, to let me, I'll, I'll, I'll go back and look at it. So, I mean, conceptually, this is the problem here. You have the backbone of the internet, which is pretty much a competitive business. Think of it as a long haul or long distance um, transport of information packets. Then you have residential access networks like AT&T or a cable company. But let me make it clear, maybe make it simpler. Let's have only one, so let's say it's, it's AT&T. And residential customers uh, buy a subscription, let's say in the United States, something between $25 and $45 uh, a month, with an average price of $39, actually. I happened to, to look at it here <laughs> recently. So the average price in the United States for an ISP is $39 a month. So they pay a subscription. And this is the present regime. Now, these guys here have also ISPs there are, uh, through which, independent ISPs, through which they connect to the internet backbone. Um, Yahoo, uh, Google, MSN, Disney, you know, many different uh, providers of information services, of content, and so on and so on. Okay, now the proposal of AT&T is to start charging an independent fee, S, bigger than zero, directly to these providers. Okay, so that's proposal number one. And proposal number two is not to have just one S, but to have many S's, <laughs> OK? So many S's depending on whatever. Doesn't have to be a specific rule. at and never came and said, we want to charge Google more than Yahoo, but they could, right? Uh, or they didn't say, we want to charge per packet Disney more than Yahoo, but they could, and, and so on. So it's kind of a, it hasn't happened, <laughs> therefore, it's open to, to, to discussion. We don't, we don't know exactly. But do you understand this? I mean, this is a crucial picture. Uh, well, I should have utilized the, the independence here to, to, to leave it up there. But I, you know, I didn't think of it in advance. OK, so OK. OK, so now, what exactly does net neutrality mean? That's one of the problems that we have, to some extent, because too many lawyers are involved in this, is that they, the words mean different things to different people. OK, so the first definition, I would say, is absolute non-discrimination. So even if the network could not charge extra money or does not try to charge extra money, under this definition of net neutrality, it's not allowed to make any variation in the, in the quality of service or prioritization or anything like that. Number two is that the network is allowed to do all these prioritizations and so on, but they cannot charge different fees. Okay, so they, they can put this, your packets in front of his and so on, but they cannot charge uh, dif different fees. Um, number three is different tiers of service. So the network divides the, if you think of this as being the, uh, the, uh, the pipe, it divides it into two parts and says this part here is going to be for prioritized uh, bits 
and the remaining is going to be for the, for the standard service. Um, but it's going to be available for all. That is, there's going to be two tariffs. Here is one, here is two, but every provider, upstream, Google, Yahoo, and so on, is going to be able to, 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 to get the service. Now, number four is much more restrictive. It says, well, not everybody is going to be allowed to get the services, but we can make sure that uh, Google is paying more because you know they happen to have more money. So let's make make sure they pay <laughs> more than, than 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 Yahoo. And if you take it to the extreme, we can offer this fast lane only to one company. So we go to these three search companies and we tell them, look, I mean. Uh, two of you are going to be in the slow lane. One of you is going to be in the fast lane. Now, you tell us how much you're willing to pay, and we'll put you in the fast lane, whatever one of the three. And whoever has more money wins. And that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice game for, 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 the, for somebody who has monopoly power. You can extract a lot of money. Um, and you can do the same proposal. Yeah, the others are business owners. You could. You could. I mean, well, it depends on how slow it is. Yeah, I mean, it, you know. But if, they have a lot of power, don't they? Yes. I mean, you can, if you make it sufficiently slow, if this two lane becomes very slow compared to one, then only people are, he, he, let's put it that way. Everybody, or not everybody. Google has about 70% market share right now in the United States. Um, but if somebody else were to win this auction, however, you know, uh, Bill's network, <laughs> you know, uh, no, Bill's network might not be so great in terms of providing search results, but if all the other networks are delayed by 20 seconds, I mean, Bill's going to get a big market share, <laughs> you know, so there is, you know, the relativeness uh, there, the relative delay matters, you know, so it, it, it makes a difference. So, so it's interesting because some of these types of discrimination don't look so onerous, and others do. But these networks, when at least in debates with them, I offer them the opportunity to, to say that they're not going to do this, <laughs> or they're not going to do that. They said, no, we're not going to say. You know, we, we, we might do it. Well, that might be because the people that usually participate in debates don't have sufficient power to say whatever they say. They'll they get fired the next day if they say. They're not going to do something anyway. So, but but it, it, but it, it, it's a kind of a strange situation in which the AT and T and similar networks have left themselves open to criticisms of the most extreme things they could possibly do, and maybe they won't do them <laughs> anyway. So, it's in my opinion, it's pretty dumb to to, to for, from their point of view to say we might do all these things and we're not going to commit to not doing any of them anyway. So, it's uh, yes. Uh, slow degrade traffic. Um, not network management purposes for commercial. Right, but this is a traffic um, <coughs> coming from a particular provider or all types of traffic of this sort. All, all traffic. Uh, you know. Um, I mean, the ISP would try to justify it on principles of network management. Uh, yes. Yes. Let Let me go back to this under you know in a, in a couple of minutes. But there there are. You know, there was this violation of, um, there was this dispute of, um, between the Comcast, um, I, I, let, me, let me tell you what it was. Um, um, you know, Comcast is a, is a, is a, is a big uh, cable TV network, they, maybe the biggest in the United States. Well, they buy NBC now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they, but they're buying NBC. Um, but that sale has not been has not been approved yet by, by the regulatory, by the various regulatory bodies. But, okay, so Comcast at some point in time said that from now on, we're going to slow down BitTorrent bits, information packets. Why? Because they, 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 they congest the network. <laughs> so, and I guess in the back of their minds was, well, let's do this because most of the people who are downloading these things are doing something illegal, so they're not going to protest. 
But it turned out that there was one company that was selling films legally using this. <laughs> This, this company in Palo Alto, and they, 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 somehow they, they were using BitTorrent to, to download films. People, only people with licenses would do it, but you know, BitTorrent uses um, a lot of servers in a distributed way, so they would, the films would come faster that way. So they went and protested and so on and so on, and, and, and in the end, you know, Comcast went back, but it's still in a fight which has reached high courts in the United States about, um, about uh, the legality of this. So, so let me talk about this in a, in a few minutes, okay? So now Obama and his campaign has proposed this principle. Supports the, the principle that network providers should not be allowed to charge fees to privilege the content of applica or applications of some websites and internet applications <coughs> over others. Um, now I, I, was, as I was a part of this campaign and we helped write this statement. This statement is a bit vague. <laughs> I have to say, uh, a good lawyer can argue either way. Uh, are there any lawyers in here? No. Yes. Okay. So you see how we can argue it both ways. Um, they, they, you can argue. Some people would argue. Okay, this statement says that there should be no tiering. Others would say, oh, it doesn't say that. You can have tiers as long as you don't discriminate within its tier. You see, that's why we have you know, lawyers are good in this. <laughs> and uh, so it's kind of. Uh, vague. But what happened? Okay, so that was the campaign statement. The Federal Communications Commission um, has proposed, um, has issued an, an, an NPRM. NPRM means uh, request, request for what? Notice of proposal. Not exactly. Notice of proposal rulemaking. <laughs> um, which means here we, we are going to make this rule. Uh, please comment to the public. Uh, so they propose this, and let me let me read this because this is essentially the deadline for for comments was the first round was January 14, and I, I filed some comments, and there's a second round, and so on, so on. Subject to reasonable network management, the provider of broadband internet access service may not one. These were the old principles uh, formalized this uh, in, by by the um, by the FCC uh, prevent users from sending and receiving uh, lawful comments. Um, running lawful applications, um, connecting any devices they want that they don't harm the network, and deprive um, uh, the users of the entire to competition between network providers. So this was kind of the innocuous part of the NPRM. Let me go to the more contentious part. Number two. Subject to reasonable network management, a provider of Roman uh, internet service must, must treat lawful content applications and services in a non-discriminatory manner. And then they say, well, what do we think is non-discriminatory? So one paragraph says, paragraph 106 says this, we understand the term non-discriminatory to mean that the broadband network access service provider may not charge, may not charge, right, uh, uh, a fee for to, to a content provider. And um, we propose this would prevent the broadband, okay. If, uh, and they also say, we think that also, this means that the providers, the I'm sorry, the networks should not charge different prices. Um, but at the same time, the NPRM is a bit vague of what non-discriminatory means, and they ask for comments on what non-discriminatory means. Uh, you know, when you ask for comments on what words mean, that's problematic, right? I mean, <laughs> it's just. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, this is the way regulation works in the United States. I mean, you know, there's, it's a free for all for all the lawyers. I mean, everybody files and everybody uh, gets consultants and so on and so on. Anyway, bottom line is the FCC right now is proposing non-discrimination. And it's proposing non-discrimination, first, no fees, second, no differential fees. Okay. The EU has a similar directive, which is kind of a bit more, you know, Nice. It says that that is high importance. It doesn't say must, right? <laughs> that that is high importance to preserving the open and neutral character of the internet, taking full account of the will of the co-legislators and so on and so on, to enshrine net neutrality as a policy incentive, uh, objective, and regulatory principle to be promoted and so on and so on, and then strengthening uh, related transparency requirements. So essentially, you know, the EU position is in many ways similar, 
It's just that it's done in a more polite way. It doesn't say must, but in practice, you know, when it, when it comes to violations, there will be a must. So, I mean, this is the way you things work in Europe. I mean, it, it might, they might say it in a very nice way, but if you start, <laughs> if you start going far away from it, they, they, they go after you. OK, so let me start saying now the essence of what this paper and this debate is about. What I think are the, going to be the consequences of departure from net neutrality. OK, so the first one is what this paper is about. So the academic paper that I, I showed you, the one with Joachim, is only dealing with number one. So it says the following. Essentially, this is the main theorem of the paper. Um, that if you start two-sided pricing, if you start pricing now on the side of the um, providers, um, then um, it will be in the benefit of a, of a monopolist or duopolist, but will not be desirable <coughs> for society. That is, if you think of the objective of society, and I'll explain what exactly the objective of society should be, but if you do that, if you look at the objective of society, it will not be good for society. Okay? And the objective of society will be a measure of a uh, combination of benefits to consumers and profits of the companies. And I'll, I'll explain it in, in, in detail later. But I'll, I'll come back to number one. But I'll, 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 I want to say two, two, three, four, five, and six before going back to number one, because these are other things that are not in the paper, but are also bad consequences, or at, at least undesirable consequences consequence of, of net neutrality. OK, number two. Um, <clears throat> OK, so this is what we, we had started talking about. If you start prioritizing to the other side of the network, it, degrade, it might degrade the arrival of packets that originate from non-paying firms. So remember that diagram. Here was some restriction that goes to the, to the prioritized lane. And therefore, the arrival of packets in lane number two might be slower. Um, now. It's very hard for the law to say how big this lane should be and how small the other lane should be. So it will be up to the network, practically, to, to say to, to make this determination. And therefore, by manipulating the size of the lane, um, the provider can make these things as slow as they want. And that's a serious concern, because since the residential access networks only control one or maybe two routers, it's not clear if they can really make things much faster, <laughs> if, if the number one lane is really going to be much faster. But definitely, there's al it's always possible to make things slower. <laughs> so if, if only the relative uh, speed matters, then they can implement the scheme, create the artificial scarcity, and so on. And additionally, there's a kind of a more fine point that has been raised in the literature on net neutrality. Um, if you start discrimination, between, and you have two different services, a first class service and a, and a second class service. It makes sense from, as a network, to make the second class uh, uh, pipe more congested, to make them slower artificially, so that the first class service becomes more valuable. <laughs> this, this is, there's a series of papers starting back with uh, uh, Deneker and McAfee in, in 96, I believe, uh, who wrote on um, um, discrimination of this sort. And he was talking about uh, Intel chips and, and related stuff. He wasn't talking about the internet. But there is a lot, a lot, of, lot of discussion of that. And, if, and some of the very early work, um, uh, there, are, there were papers written in, by French engineers in the 1850s trying to say why the third class service of the, of the French rail was that bad. <laughs> and they say the real reason why, why this was not bad is not because they couldn't really invest and fix it, but because they want to make the life really difficult of, of you if you are in third class so that you don't go to third class. So that you go to, the, to, 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 first, to second class and so on. So anyway, so this is, this is a second problem. The third problem is the identity-based discrimination that I discussed, descri described a bit, a bit earlier. By doing identity-based discrimination, by saying one guy gets it, gets the fast service and nobody else, the network can pick the winners in its class, in its type of other side market. They can pick the winner in search. They can pick the winner in uh, content, uh, in this and that and that. And it's, it's, it's unreasonable. Um, let me say another economic reason why I think it's unreasonable. Because 
the residential networks in the United States uh, make about $20 billion of revenue from this ISP service. Their main job is, their main um, sales are not in this area. Like there are telecommunications networks like AT&T or cable networks that sell TV channels. Okay. They make $20 billion. Well, $20 billion a year is a tiny amount of money compared to the profits and the consumer satisfaction of the other side of the market. I mean, that could be half a trillion, maybe more. So to, to, to let these guys who make $20 billion to, to control what, what happens in the half a trillion is completely crazy and absurd. And I think the regulators understand this and they're, they're, they're going to do the right thing in this case. Number four, there is a problem with innovation in this. Um, if the identity-based identity discrimination happens, then the winner is picked by the network, the winner on the other side, let's say Google or Yahoo or, or Microsoft, um, but firms with small capitalization will never really be able to be the winners because they will never be able to pay. So that's one problem. They're not going to be able to, to get in the game. And it will discourage um, innovation because they will know that they will not be able to win. There is a second problem, which is because of the existence of network effects, people can get, you can have lock-in. You know, the winner that is picked today, let's say in search, could be perpetuated. <laughs> and, you know, let me explain. Well, suppose this kind of, remember this scheme in which I pick the winner, right? Um, suppose I do this in 2000. Who do I pick? 2000. 2000, Google didn't exist, right? Or didn't exist in existence as a commercial company, right? They couldn't pay money. Uh, so um, who would I pick? I would, have, I would have picked Yahoo, most likely. Possibly Microsoft, right? But not Google, for sure, right? But then what happens? Suppose they get locked. Suppose that I, I, I get locked in. How can I be locked in? Because these other guys will never reach the customers. The customers never knows the the, the new firms. The customers uh, would never know. The, the consumers would never know firms that that don't have a chance to reach them. Therefore, we can get really permanently locked in to some bad equilibrium. Okay. So that's that that, that, that that's a problem. Number five. The, the people can, all, can favor their own content, okay? So, for example, there are independent vo voice over IP providers in the United States, like Vonage. Uh, but then at and also sells telecom services. The cable companies sell their own cable service. So they have every reason to make it difficult for an independent voice over IP provider. Uh, what about video? Uh, a lot of people say in the United States that the whole debate, network neutrality debate right now, is because of video. Because right now, for the first time, there is a lot of video that people can download independently of the TV channels. But if I'm a cable guy, I'm trying to sell TV channels. If these people start downloading video, that's a disaster, right? I mean, you know, that's, you know I, I, I will lose my, my, my customers. Um, and th this is a problem that is going to distort competition and reduce total surplus. And um, let me also say that Maybe this is kind of too esoteric, but, but a vertically integrated um, company um, that does two different things, network provision and uh, network uh, transportation and provision of a separate service, like uh, voice over IP as a cable network, um, even if it charges the same price to the outside voice over IP people and to itself, it wouldn't work because internally it's like taking money from one pocket and putting it to the other. If I charge a high price for everybody, it doesn't matter for me because I'm vertically integrated. I just take the money from one pocket, put it in the other, and it's as if I'm, I'm, I'm still at marginal cost. While the independent guy, like Vonage, they have to pay the high price. So, 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 non so, so what appears as non-discriminatory is not really non-discriminatory for vertically integrated um, companies. The sixth one um, is that you know, this really disrupts the way the internet works. The internet is a, is a series of networks that are connected in many ways. Some are like this, but if you have this last guy start saying, I'm going to start collecting money from this guy, you know, then Anybody who might find himself in some market power anywhere 
can start saying, oh, I'm going to collect money from Google, and why not just Google? Why not, why not we go to Microsoft? Why don't we go to everyone? You know, so it will create a, 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 an all-out war in which every network will try to collect money from everybody else. I mean, that's crazy. I mean, that really not only bypasses the existing and well-functioning market, but uh, it's going to be a total free-for-all. I mean, it's, it's insane. At least that's my, my opinion. I mean, that doesn't make sense um, at, at all. So now let me go to number one. How many? I probably have a few minutes left, so let me go to yeah. number one. Yeah, OK. Uh, so I want to talk about number one, because essentially the other effects I hope I convince you by waving my hands that they they are going to be uh, breaking net neutrality are going to be is going to be bad for for society. So I want to discuss this number one. Okay. So um, let me. Um, okay. So this is what I want to show you that um, um, total surplus decrease. I'll explain what total surplus is too. Okay. So. Hopefully, this math is not going to be too difficult. Um, but if, if it's too difficult, uh, let me know. Or maybe I can skip some of it. Um, but th the idea of, of this model is that we have network effects. So the utility of a consumer is some standalone utility minus something that has to do with differentiation, product differentiation, how much he likes the different products minus the price he pays, plus, and this is the crucial term, some network effects coming from having many content providers. So this is the utility of a customer down here, but he cares about a lot of network of, 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 of providers up here. And this is captured by this piece. Okay? It's a positive coefficient here times the number of network providers. So if I'm a customer, you know, I, I care about, I have some standalone utility, I have some product differentiation, I care about price, but I also care about um, having a lot of providers. And this is how I capture the so-called network effects for the customers. The customers care about having a lot of content up, up, up there. So that's the, the beginning of the model. The second part of the model is what about the the other guys, the, the providers. So how, how, does, how do the providers, what are the providers' profits? Okay, the way I have set it up, the providers earn money from advertising. So each provider puts an ad. Um, with some probability, the consumer hits this ad. And therefore, the revenue of, the, of a typical provider is the ad times the number of um, of customers times some coefficient. And then he has to pay AT&T some fee. We said that we allow for this fee, right, for the provider to pay some fee. And then he has some fixed cost. But these fixed costs are, are vary across providers. And this is important for me because I want to be able to, under some circumstances, make some providers go out of business. So some providers, depending if, for example, if this fee bec becomes very high, then some of, this, some of these providers are going to go out of business because their profits are going to be less than zero. You understand? So this is OK. And again, notice that because of this, uh, because of this term, and it has the number of customers in here, I also have network effects from the customers to the providers. The provider likes to have a lot of customers because he has a bigger probability of getting, he, of getting more revenue. His revenue gets higher if he has more providers. So to summarize it, here is the stylized model. Here is the platform, which you should think of as the network, or AT&T. Okay. So it charges some money to consumers, and it charges some potential money to, to content providers. But there are these network effects. So there's a network effect that goes um, from the consumer to the content provider, and we call this A. So this is the value of an extra customer to a content provider. And then there is some value of a content provider to a consumer. So the consumer gets some value B of, because of the existence of this extra network provider. So this is a model with network effects on, with two network effects. I'm saying this maybe more as a note to, 
to economists who might know from earlier literature about models with one network effect. I mean, that there were earlier models had only one network effect. This one has two. And how big these two are, as you will see in a moment, is crucially important. How big is A compared to B? This, this comparison between A and B makes a big, a big difference. OK, so uh, don't worry about this. I'm, I'm skipping this. <laughs> this is, I want you to just pay attention to the last part. So I comp think of the first, the, 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 the first part and the previous page as I computed an equilibrium. <laughs> So you don't have to see all the details of the equilibrium. But the equilibrium involves a fee by um, AT&T to, to the upper side of the market, to the provider side of the market, which is positive if A is bigger than B, which means when content providers value additional consumers more than consumers value additional providers. So this is a specific condition which we can test and see in every network of this side of this type, do we, is A bigger than B or B bigger than A? Okay, and if and, and, and if it, and A is bigger than B, then I know that AT and T will not to, will want to charge a positive charge. Let me give you some examples. So here's the examples. So the crucial thing was the A and the B, and I was telling you that for our case, which is internet consumers, internet platform consumers here, content providers here. I said that for this case, um, th this SM is bigger than zero. So we don't really know if it's bigger than zero or not, but the left side is the ones that are bigger than zero. Similarly for game platforms. In, in game platforms, we know that the game platform uh, collects uh, uh, money from the people who write games. They, they collect the royalties. But then we have some other cases on this side where the opposite thing happens. In fact, the networks subsidize the people who play the, the, that role up there. Um, and when does this happen in, P, in uh, operating systems? The operating systems, like Microsoft, subsidize people who write applications. Now, you might think it's unthinkable, you know, why would Microsoft do that? But they do. <laughs> they, they, uh, they find ways to subsidize them by giving them free software, um, uh, embedded subroutines in Windows, and, 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 and so on. Similarly, the credit card um, uh, banks uh, uh, subsidize um, um, consumers. I'm not sure if they do this here. Do you get, do you get uh, miles or stuff like that? Um, no? Yeah, you yes. Get interest -free, um, introduction. Well, do you get uh, cash? Well, I'll give you an example here. Here's a card. It's an example of a card that does this. <laughs> Here's this card. Not this one, this one. Okay, so here's a card that is owned, that is issued by some, a brokerage house, Fidelity. What do they do? They charge American Express 3%. They give me 2%. Across the board, no matter what, or any transaction, <laughs> any transaction you want, they give you 2%. They just deposit it in your account at the end of the month. Once you pay them, of course, you know, you've paid them <laughs> first. In American Express. They don't charge you, American Express. They don't charge me anything. They don't charge me a fee for having the card. All I need, to, all you need to do is ha open an account with this brokerage firm, which means nothing. You know, just open an account. It doesn't have any fees or anything like that. And this is this is perfectly legitimate. And similarly, the competitor Visa has the same thing, um, and and and, other, and 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 so on and so on. That means you buy something with your American Express. With this one. Not only American Express, this one. With that cost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Say, yeah. The vendor pays American Express. Three percent. Oh, that's that, 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 that they do anyway. Yes, that, I mean, yeah, yeah. But that's if you charge it on, on American Express. That's right. But you're charging it on this. Yeah, this is American Express. It's owned well, by American Express. I see it is American Express. Yeah, it's, I know it's too, too small. I see. You know, but the, no, but the point is, look, I mean, you know, how does this work? I mean, you know, the, uh, the, I have every reason to use this card compared to any other. <laughs> Right? <laughs> Obviously. I mean, you know, I go to a vendor. I mean, he tells me, oh, I don't like American Express. Well, I don't care if you like American Express. <laughs> <laughs> you, they give me 2%. I mean, you know. It's like a frequent flyer. Uh, yes, but the frequent flyer. flyers are stuff that are kind of uh, in kind. And yeah. they, you don't know when, the, when British Airways might change its mind and start changing the rules. You know, this is cash. I mean, it's completely different <laughs> than, uh, than anything else with no restrictions. 
And, and by now, I think it's only a matter of time until enough consumers understand this and the other cars just die. Because, you know, eventually, I mean, when, when people understand this, everybody's going to go to that. You know, and, uh, and, and already they have gone. I mean, they started with American Express, and now has, Visa has introduced the same thing. So it's just a matter of time until, you know, we all go into this kind of stuff. So anyway, why do I say this? Because it's kind of an example of this, you know, when, with, with particular parameters, the, uh, the um, uh, network the here, Visa or American Express, wants to subsidize one side of the market. They give money to this side of the market and they take it from the other. Or, you know. Okay, so now net neutrality would mean the regulator imposes a particular fee, fee equal to zero for me, and we want to see the effects of that. Okay, now I want you to not worry about the rest of this, but just think of the first line. Okay, let me try to, to explain what I'm trying to, what is societal, the societal interest um, here, total surplus. What's the idea of total surplus? Um, are you familiar with the idea of consumer surplus to start with? Hmm. Some people don't. Maybe, let me tell you. Okay, hold on a second. I don't see everybody being so enthusiastic about this. So let me tell you what consumer surplus is. Have you ever seen diagrams like this, demand supply diagrams? Oh, yes. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, great. <laughs> well, that's great. I mean, that's, that's the most important thing. Okay, now, suppose we have a price here. So suppose this is the market price. We call it P star. Okay, now all these guys up here are willing to pay more than P star. Obvious? Okay. If we add the amount of money that they're willing to pay minus what they actually pay, we get this triangle, right? Well, this triangle is called consumer surplus. So it's an effect of having a single price, price in the market. Because there's a single price in the market, I'm willing to pay more, I don't have to pay more. Okay. So this is one term in the societal satisfaction. What about the other two? The other two are profits of the network and profits of the content providers. So society in this kind of setup has to have three pieces. It has to be what the consumers benefit from the existence of the network, the actual profits of the network, which is the first term, and the last term, which is the profits of the upstream providers, the content providers or applications providers and so on. And that I call total surplus, um, and it, it should be our objective. Or I mean, Some people might disagree that this should be our objective, but it's a kind of a long lecture on why should this should be our objective or not. Traditionally, in, in, in economics, there is no third term. Why? Because there's no other side of the market. So people, if you read economics papers and they, they talk about total surplus, it's just profits plus consumer surplus. But here we have another term, and this term is important and should be added to it. Okay? So I have this. So the, the, the real question is, if we're trying to maximize pi, which is this pi, and, or maximize total surplus. What policies, what kind of prices would we choose to maximize profits or to maximize total surplus? And to show you that, in fact, these policies are going to be different, that to maximize profits, AT&T would like to charge both sides, but to maximize total surplus, in fact, we would be better off to, to subsidize one side. You see that? That's kind of the objective of this paper. Okay, so this goes into many, many, many pieces. So let me try to, 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 to say it in a more summarized form. In this network, like any network, we have network effects. What does network effects mean? It means that when I produce one more unit, it has benefits to people who don't buy that unit, to the rest of the network. Okay? So I produce this extra subscription in the network. It has benefit to everybody else. A new content provider comes in, it has benefit to everybody else. Okay. So what does this mean? This means that pricing on, the, on, 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 the, on any network should be below cost. Why? Because how else are we going to take into account the benefits of, to everybody else? If I just price at cost, I'm disregarding the benefits of new subscribers to, to the network. 
If everybody, think of, think of us as a network here. If everyone pays just for cost, okay, then when I add myself, suppose I'm the last one, I add myself to the network, I pay cost, but I get the, you, you all guys get the benefit from me. <laughs> and if I, if I pay cost, then this benefit is disregarded. In fact, I should pay below cost because that would internalize the benefit to everybody else. And that's true in every network. I mean, it's not special to the internet. The price should be below cost. Now, what happens here is that means that if one side of the network, let's say AT&T to users, has a price above cost, then the other side should be below cost. And this is not, it shouldn't be a big surprise when you formulate it the way I'm saying it. If we're trying to have an overall price below cost, and one side, for whatever reason, is above cost, the other side should be below cost. Okay, that's the essence of, this, of, this, of the argument on this. So there's a lot of equations and so on. But if you understand what I'm telling you right now, you understood essentially why one side should be below cost. Now, I'm not, I really don't care so much if it's going to be Google side that's about below cost or AT&T side that's going to be, or at and to user that's going to be below cost. That it's possible that we have some network in which it's better for the providers to pay and the users to, to be subsidized. I mean, I, I'm not going to, to say that it's out of the question. It doesn't come out of the formulation of this paper, but it's not completely out of the question. But definitely one of the two sides should be below, below cost. So, and here it's the, 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 providers, the provider side. So maybe I convinced you on that. Let me show, show a lot of equations here. Let me <laughs> um, okay. So this is essentially the result. This says that if a regulator or a planner is trying to set this fee optimally, this fee being the fee from AT&T to the providers, taking into account the effect of this fee also on the monopoly price of AT&T towards the users, then it should set it below cost, below zero here. Okay? So, the, the, again, the reasoning for that is what I just told you before. Because of network effects, you want the price to be below um, below cost. And one nice thing about this, at least in this model, is that even though, um, even if AT&T were to subsidize the upstream providers, the platform would still make positive profits. AT&T would still make positive profits because it collects this other money from the, from the users to charge positive prices on both sides. So now, when I get to this point, a lot of people say, well, doesn't Google make enough money? Now you're saying to subsidize them too, <laughs> you know? And the truth is that we're make, I'm making comparison about, you know, what should be done, what would bring more benefits to the network. And this is not just about Google. I mean, a lot of people pay attention to the very large companies, the very successful companies, but this, F, this S fee is going to have an effect on marginal guys, on people who would go out of business depending on, west, on, on whether S is below zero or not. If, it's, if it's S is above zero, they might go out of business. So what I'm saying is that they should, they should be below zero. Now, in fact, net neutrality doesn't mean S below zero. It means S equals zero. But S equals zero is better than S above zero, which is what um, AT&T asks. So we should not, if, we, if it's not possible to go to S below zero, then at least we should go to S equals zero, which is net, net, net neutrality. Okay, so I showed you this, and I don't have to show you this. Okay, then, okay, and I can do this also with duopoly, because a lot of people might say, well, you know, look, I mean, AT&T is not alone, right? It has a cable company that competes. In almost all the markets, there are two companies that compete, and I can do, bring the same results out with, with, with duopoly. So, okay, so I, I don't want to, I won't show you all the equations. Okay, so here's the conclusion then. Uh, um, so this is the conclusion of the paper. Charging a positive price on the other side of the market is desirable for the monopolist or the duopolist, but not desirable for society. And the earlier arguments that complex pricing schemes, you know, take it or leave it contracts, identity-based discrimination, uh, prioritization of lanes, and so on, so on, um, degradation of bathing service are likely to reduce total surplus additionally. Okay, one, one last caveat on this. Okay, one potential criticism of this paper, which you didn't, uh, you didn't say it, but I'll say it, <laughs> is, uh, is that it's based on advertising. 
that people are not selling stuff there. Their co the companies collect the revenue through advertising. Okay? And some companies, are not some companies are collecting money from advertising, like the search companies, but other companies are actually selling you stuff. Uh, like they might sell you content like uh, films on the internet um, and so on. So uh, I have another model <laughs> to deal with that, it's a slightly different model, but, very, but in some ways very similar. So in which you can think of, um, I, I had written here as platform and applications, but you can think of this as being um, um, uh, uh, network. Um, the, the, the call, call the platform the network, and call the um, uh, the applications the content providers. Okay, and we're talking then about these fees, right? The S fees. These are fees from platform to content providers or applications, and uh, in a very similar logic. I have this other paper which was published in Management Science a couple of years ago, which shows the same things. Essentially that um, in terms of total surplus, society is better off if these S's are below zero or zero rather than positive. Uh, although the, the, the providers can, 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 can charge positive things. And, and this is done even though the content providers are able to charge positive prices directly to consumers. Is that sort of like iTunes? Is, is that, that it's what? Kind of, is like, like what? Like iTunes, where you can buy a movie or buy a song per, per song or per movie, and they That's have right. different prices. Exactly. Yeah. So or you can buy from, yeah, different download different movies, download different songs, and so on and so on. Um, and this says uh, society is better off if the network that is intermediating this transaction doesn't charge extra money to Apple. That's, because that's a one, one possibility. Well, okay, so I might have taken more than I thought, uh, but uh, this is the paper, and I'm very glad to talk about other questions because I'm sure there are many, and I didn't cover everything that can be said about this. Uh, but feel free to ask any, any question that you haven't asked yet. <laughs> okay. yeah, um, could you explain a bit uh, why, what do you mean by the transportation cost T presenting the utility fee? Oh, in the utility function. Oh, that's no big deal. This is, um, okay, here's the utility function. You're talking about this, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, when you write an economics model, um, you want to be sure that if you have small changes in price, you don't have big changes in sales. So the way to do that is to have the consumers not be identical. Because if they were identical, then a small change in price would either would make them from all, pay, all buying to all not buying. And how do we do this? We do it by having this differentiation here. See, this, this, this consumer index is I, yeah. and different consumers are, 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 have different... Hmm? In the network. I'm sorry, I don't it's, hear you. It's the uh, position of the each consumer. Yeah, in, in, I, I don't know if you're familiar. Yeah, are you familiar with the, with, the, with, the, with the model of hoteling? Yeah. Yes. So if you're familiar with the model of hoteling, people who are on, on a zero one line mm -hmm. and they have a most preferred variety. Yeah, okay, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> their utility function is something like this. Right? The, this is their most preferred variety, but if you give them something else, let's say you give them the, the variety Y, they lose some utility. Okay? The utility that they lose, this vertical distance, is T, some parameter times Xi minus Y. Okay? So, now, if I start changing the price, um, some people are going to drop out of the market, but not everybody. So that's why we need this differentiation to be able to make this happen. If you're familiar with the <coughs> model of hoteling, this is very much like this. This is hoteling. Let me write yeah, it down. Yeah, I'm no, I'm writing for everybody else. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Okay, so... Uh, an economist, so. <laughs> what, I, I, yeah. what is, it seems to me, pretty difficult in this kind of model where you have a network is just to use this kind of notion of distance. Um, 
to differentiate. No, this is not a distance in the network. This is yeah. a distance in the. In, in, you, you need the consumers to be differentiated. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, I mean, look. Otherwise, look. It doesn't have to do anything with the, with the internet. This is. We need to write a model that won't blow up. Right, I need to be able to have equilibria and stuff like that. I mean, ugh, that's what it, it needs. That uh, uh, there's, there's nothing more I can say. I mean, you know, if you, unless you unless you you impose this kind of differentiation, uh, the model will will blow up. It will not reflect reality. It will. You're yeah. with me on that? Yeah, I agree. Yes, you agree. Okay, good. Mm. <laughs> I mean, to me, that just seems like the price that is a consumer would pay to your ISP to access the content, and your ideal position would be a price of zero, but mm. that's not realistic, so is that... Say it again, one so more time. So th that's what you as a consumer would, would be charged by your ISP to be accessing the content in the first place. I mean, that's that T. The, right? the, no. Oh, no. No, no. You, you, what, what you pay your ISP is the P. Oh, right. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. The, the T in this parameter has to do with the way that consumers are varying in, in, in terms of their preferences. Okay. Because you see, okay, let me explain this one more time. Okay, here we have a, we, you want to have a demand curve that looks kind of like this, right? You don't want a demand curve that looks like this. Yeah. <laughs> in which going from this price, this is P star, going from right below P star to right above P star goes from here to zero. You don't want to do that. I mean, you, that doesn't, the model would not work, and it would not also be reflective of the world. I mean, if, if the price changes a bit, let's say a couple of dollars, will everybody start having, stop having Internet access? I mean, if it goes up by a couple of dollars, no. I mean, you know, some people are going to drop out, but not everybody. So you want to have this differentiation. This so this, this term here just ensures a differentiation. Mm -hmm. Believe me, that's perfectly normal. The, 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 the thing that I want you to pay attention to is this term. This term is, the, is the, the not normal, the one that has the network effects, the one that is not necessarily there in non-network industries. And it says that the consumer cares about how many upstream providers there are. Because the main criticism, let me also say, some, what, 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 what do people say who are pro at and <laughs> What do they say? They say, look, I mean, you don't let us have price discrimination. Well, what's wrong with price discrimination? I mean, price discrimination is something that, you know, it's not necessarily illegal. It could have benefits and so on. But on the other hand, in, in a world, they miss the, the idea of the two-sidedness, of the network effects. They miss the network effects. If there were no network effects in the internet, it wouldn't be so bad to have price discrimination. Well, you know, it's not the end of the world to have price discrimination in non-network setup. But with networks, price discrimination can have bad effects because it would kill innovation. It would kill the, the, the network effects. It could kill the harnessing of the network effects, I should say. Wouldn't one of the things that the provider would say be, for example, that, well, we, we're in a free market economy, so things are self-adjusting. So, for example, well, you know, I'm going to discriminate in this particular way. And I've got my competitors who can easily choose not to discriminate, and the consumers can just migrate to them if, if they don't like what I'm doing to them, for example. Yeah, I, they can say that. But the problem, I tell you, the, 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 there are a couple of problems with that. The first problem is that uh, suppose I'm a consumer of AT&T and I have um, a competitor, let's say Comcast, so either Comcast or AT&T, and Comcast decides not to do discrimination, but AT&T does the discrimination. And I'm originally an AT&T customer. It, it's not going to be obvious to me if the bits are coming slow, why they're coming slow. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't know. I would say, well, Google screwed up. I mean, that's why the bits are coming slow. I mean, you know, it's not, you know, why is it obvious that, you know, AT&T is making them go slow? You know, it wouldn't be obvious at all. No. I wouldn't know. Oh, yeah, I was just playing devil's advocate. No, no, but I'm saying, I mean, look, look at the problem of the uncertainty that I would face. That's, uh, that's the first problem. The second problem is, okay, and that's kind of for, uh, for something I know something about, let's say Google. Things that there are effects of com on companies that I don't know anything about. Like the, the more obscure guys who might even not enter. Or the, the more obscure guys I've never heard before, but because they're so slow, I'll never see them. You know? So these are not sufficiently documented to me as a user to prompt me to go to, to the other provider. See, if I knew everything, 
and it was everything was obvious. Yeah. You're right. I would go from one cost from one company to the other, but things are not that obvious. But I guess you're switching costs. Are there is also additional switching costs, like you said. What What do you mean by switching costs? Switching costs means that I I have to physically go to a different network. This is not just an issue okay. of uh, using uh, Google search versus Yahoo search. This is an issue of uh, having a different wire <laughs> in my house and reconfiguring it and stuff like that. And that's a serious problem. A third problem, maybe not so much here, but definitely in, 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 the, in the United States, is that uh, in, IS, Internet service is also sold as a bundle with other services. So typically, people who buy Internet service from Comcast also buy video from, Com from Comcast. And people who buy something from AT&T also buy something else from AT&T. So if I were to change my internet service, I shouldn't really care only about my internet price and the internet quality and so on, but I should also care about the other parts of the bundle. So I have significant friction in going from one to the other, and that friction by itself creates market power. See, you know, as this model, I said one company or two, and some people might say, well, what if we had 10? Would the problem disappear? And the truth is that it doesn't disappear because there's always this network effect, this uh, switching costs. The switching costs would be there even if I had 10 guys, <laughs> the, uh, providers uh, the, down here. They wouldn't disappear. Um, anyway, maybe I'm taking too strong of a position. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Uh, so I have two questions, if I may. Sure. Um, the first one, one, one at a time, yeah. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the first is, could you say a little about how your duopoly model relates to the work by Kaylord and Julian on the kind of chicken and egg problem? They have a, a yeah. duopoly model too. It's, it's, well, this model, I mean, even the monopoly model is very much related to theirs. Um, <coughs> um, let me see. Because of this two side, because of this network effect. Sure. So here is one network effect in this picture. Here is the other network effect in the other picture, you know, this first this term here. Um, and, you know, if you look at their paper, you will see something that if you read it carefully, it looks very much like this. <laughs> you know, if you, if you, you know, maybe they don't have exactly this diagram, but uh, their main idea is, is this. Um, so, okay. I'm just curious because if I remember correctly, they have a result um, in which the firms effectively dissipate all of their profits in a race to subsidize one side of the market and become a dominant firm. And I just wondered how this uh -huh. compares with your result that um, we don't have this kind of race to subsidize and they'd both like to charge um, a positive. Um, yeah, I, I think that these models can be sensitive to this kind, to, to different, to specific assumptions. Um, Sure. So I wouldn't be able to answer 100% your question I get it. on that. <laughs> uh, I have to, to, to look at it one more time. I, I, I know this paper well, but I don't remember exactly. Yeah. It's a bit of a confusing paper, I think. It's, <laughs> it's, it's OK. I mean, you, you have to understand this, this literature is relatively new. I mean, by relatively means really relative. I mean, you know, compared to the rest of economics, which has a few hundred years <laughs> of, of, of existence, um, uh, this literature is only 20, 20, 25 years old, and, uh, but it has really taken off, and a lot of people are writing on it. Lots and lots of people are writing on it, but I think the questions are not fully answered. I mean, so I, I, I'm sure that somebody can tweak the assumptions of my model in a bit, maybe not, maybe not just a bit, but to some extent, and get different, completely different results. Not completely different, but somewhat different results. So I'm not... It's not the end, you know, it's not something that is, you know, sure. Yeah. Um, the second thing is just to play devil's advocate again, uh, related to the last point. Um, so you talked about having ostensibly a fast lane and a slow lane in the internet pipeline. And this is effectively third order price discrimination where um, mm -hmm. I have an incentive to down distort the quality of yeah. the low quality service. Um, so one result that comes out of this literature is that um, this creation of the low quality service can open up a market which didn't exist before and bring new consumers in um, that otherwise wouldn't have been served at all. Mm -hmm. And so do you think um, there's anything to be said for the argument that um, 
when we factor this into the network effects argument that we're bringing new guys in along with a whole load of new network effects that this could be a positive effect. Well, okay, so the first part of what you said is, 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 is right, and it's a, good, it's a good point, that it's possible that if we, if we started with a high quality good and we started selling the low quality good, the effect that we're going to be selling it at a lower price and so on would open a new market and that could be, could be good. The problem in this setup the, is that we're going the opposite way. I mean, that we have this good. <laughs> it's not a question of creating a, a lower quality good. We, we already have this good. I mean, and uh, if we're going to degrade it, I mean, people couldn't possibly be, be better off. So the argument that you were making before is if we had a high quality good, like we have, let's say, Sony TV, top of the line, and we decided we're going to have uh, a lower quality TV, so, you know, I don't, I don't want to put a name on it because I'm being taped. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so nobody sues me, okay? So a low quality TV, yeah, we, we, we create a new market, yeah, that works. But if you just took the Sony TVs and degraded them, that wouldn't help anybody. Do you see the difference in the, in the two, in the, in the arguments? Perhaps. Or, or if you, if, even if you degraded half the Sony TVs and gave them a different name, you know, as long as there were still Sony TVs and we, you, you made them worse, I mean, it wouldn't be, you, it wouldn't work. It would, it, it, the argument is not going to go through. Sure, I think maybe it could be a little more subtle in the kind of network framework in the sense that um, now we can degrade the quality provided for the the content providers and then change the corresponding price on the other side of the market to mm -hmm. the consumers and create um, a new low cost, so lower cost service for the consumers mm -hmm. and maybe mm -hmm. this could improve network oh, yeah. penetrations. Right, but, but I, I, maybe I didn't say it explicitly in this model, but in this model, this P changes when the S changes. So I'm not having P fixed. So the P that I'm using in this model is a function of S. So if, for example, S becomes positive, that is AT&T starts charging a positive price, and this is a, a, a downward sloping function. So if S goes up, then the P goes down. So, and this is taken into account, so it's not disregarded. But even with this happening, the, the model, there's still incentives to have S negative because it increases the network effects. Sure. And, 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 it, and another way to say it is that the, the network that is AT&T is not able to internalize all these network effects in its, in its, in its pricing. And, and that is why you know, network neutrality, kind of a regulatory rule, is, is, is necessary. If, if AT&T was able to internalize all that stuff, then they would be able to, to have the optimal pricing out there, and we wouldn't need to worry about it, and we would be you know, happy without intervening. Um, but the, I, I, one, one thing I didn't say is that the network right now, the way it has been run, it's run under net neutrality, and it has gone pretty, it has gone pretty well. So therefore, trying to formalize this kind of uh, setup is, is, in my opinion, a good, a good idea. Uh, Anyway, if you if you if you're really interested, I can send you my 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 my, inter my, my filing to the FCC, <laughs> which, uh, which says you know this is this and this and that. But but um, but I did promise. I thought I promised a, a paper, right on on this. So I will you know <laughs> I, I will give you a paper that I'm is. I'm very uh, glad it's uh, on tape. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did you do have a question? Uh, just to launch one more argument that the carriers often give um, more in the network management context. So back to your question about yeah. degrading as opposed to charging content providers for priority. Um, they will often say that if you foreclose the possibility of them managing the network or discriminating, then you're losing the benefit of them being able to innovate within the network as opposed to the innovation at the edges of the network, which is, I think, yeah. it's more with your conception of what the content providers can provide to subscribers. And I'm wondering if how, how that argument plays for you and um, if you've seen anyone model well, that kind of the innovation within the network benefit versus the edges of the network benefit. OK. I, I actually think that the you know, network management is not quite innovation in the network. I mean, innovation 
innovation in the network in infrastructure happens, but it doesn't happen by the provide by the, the, the AT and T. It happens by Cisco or people who who make the infrastructure. I mean, these are completely different people <laughs> that that are that are making the network. Uh, um, now, I'm I'm not against network management, and some network management is definitely necessary. Um, the the question is, do we does the discrimination that happens through network management? Why does it happen? Does it happen because the network wants to promote its own programs or service and so on, or does it happen for the general benefit of the of the consumers? That's question number one. I guess question number two is. Do the consumers know what's going on? <laughs> like, if I'm going to to set up to, to to buy from Comcast, I would like to know if Com if Comcast is killing BitTorrent or not. It would be it would be useful for me to know. Um, I I also think there's a more subtle uh, thing here in, in, involved that. I mean, many times Comcast would say, "Look, I mean, you know, we have to do this because there are some people who use the network too much." You know, it's, just, it's not just BitTorrent, but I have some guy who runs a server. The server works 24 hours a day, you know, and, and the poor guys near him get nothing, especially in the, in the cable network because they share the, 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 the bandwidth to, to, until the last node. And I actually think that, first of all, in my opinion, people shouldn't really be penalized because people designed the network wrong. I mean, come on. I mean, <laughs> this, is, this, is a, this is their mistake. I mean, not, 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 not necessarily the users. And the second problem is that I think the networks have a lot of leeway in, in pricing. Nobody's trying to regulate their pricing towards the users. Um, and actually, that was one of my earliest arguments when I talked to these guys from Comcast. I told them, look, I mean, you know, you know, why go through all these proceedings and all that stuff? Why don't you just find different prices? You don't like the present prices? Increase them. Yeah. Just say, you know, and anybody who, who, does, who does that is going to get a higher price. Now, a lot of people object to what I'm saying. People say, well, well they should never do that. But I, don't think it, I think it's reasonable. I mean, if people are, are overusing the system, they should be paying more. Uh, and that's not a violation of net neutrality. I think it's normal. I think it's perfectly normal in any market if you're using it a lot <laughs> to pay more, uh, right? But um, the, I think that the, the, these providers probably think that they cannot really charge a high price because their price is high already. Um, what about yeah. usage-based pricing? I mean, look, in principle, I'm not against usage-based pricing. But if usage-based pricing is, is a way to create lower and lower quality goods, I would, I would, it would be very problematic. I mean, right now, like I was showing you, the U.S. has very low penetration as it is. If usage pricing means that we're going to increase the average price, you know, and we're going to, to, to use it to, to, to have higher pricing, that's, that's, that would be problematic. But I wouldn't worry about trying to put a, a very high limit or a very high number of gigabytes of downloaded stuff and say whoever violates this is going to pay double. I, I, I think it's, 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 a, it's, it's not unreasonable. After all, all these networks have business services that they sell with servers. And people pay more and they get, uh, they don't get really higher quality, but they get more bandwidth. They get more, more, uh, more unrestricted um, uh, uh, abilities. So the net neutrality debate has been a bit kind of mixed up with this idea of price discrimination on one, or not price discrimination, volume and price discrimination, I meant to say, on one side of the market. So, so in principle, I wouldn't worry about it too, too, too much. But if it starts creating problems for content providers, I, I would worry about it, you know. Um, yes? Doesn't volume-based pricing indirectly discriminate against content providers whose content is by nature um, bandwidth consuming? For example, YouTube takes up much more bandwidth for the average user than, say, a text-based Yeah, but the extent to which you're going to use it is up to you. I mean, you and I can use YouTube, but uh, Bill is using it 24 hours a day. I mean, you know, there's, there's, a big, uh, there's a big difference, right? I mean, uh, I don't think that the, you know, uh, that necessarily discriminates, necessarily, discri you know, volume-based pricing, I don't think necessarily discriminates. Um, now, if you are, on the other hand, in the extreme and you have, um, 
your Cisco and you're running this very, you know, have you seen this? I mean, is this a Cisco system? No, it's not, probably not. No. And Cisco has a similar system to this, but it takes a huge amount of bandwidth, mm -hmm. really huge. I mean, then that's a problem because then the system is designed to use a huge amount of bandwidth. And uh, then we should really think seriously of ways to create a new so-called service rather than the traditional hauling service of the, of, of, of the internet. So what, make would you, what would you say is um, the logical response where an ISP invests a large amount of money inside a very new high capacity fiber optic network mm -hmm. and a third party comes along and decides to innovate and offer a new service in the network, some kind of very high bandwidth video conferencing solution. Yeah. The ISP would argue that they're free riding in the colloquial sense of that word on the ISP's investment in the network. Is that a false claim? How, how in economic terms? I, I, I didn't he hear the whole argument. You're saying, okay, so to take to have Verizon, it makes a new, they, they, they're actually doing the that. Service, for example. They have this file service, okay. So you're saying then, what was the rest of it? Uh, a third party like Cisco enters like, into a new market mm -hmm. with uh, customers of the ISP um, or with third parties and interconnects them using their network um, in order to offer some value okay. and service. Yes, I think if, I think if 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 they're if they're if they are really consuming, you know, if the service is set up to consume a huge amount of bandwidth, they should be really done as a separate service. I I think that otherwise it would it would really create problems for the network. I'm not sure if it would create problems for something like FiOS because it has a huge capacity, but if it was a, a, a DSL network, it would. So it could, you, you have to, to 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 separate the service to create a separate service, and that's. That, and at least that's my reading of network management. It shouldn't be called network management anymore. It should be some additional service, you know. Called managed should, services, right? Yeah, a managed service. Yeah, you you read the NPRM. Definitely yes. I'll come and see it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. We, we probably should close. And maybe if I could ask a, sure. one last question, and then we have time for in, more informal discussion. Sure. It seems to me that your model is so uh, could be applied to so many other areas beyond network neutrality and, and would it do violence to the model to you could I mean Google is doing and you could apply it to Google for example as a switch in markets or Google is the platform you mean yeah essentially yeah. or to an online newspaper uh, where yes. he, you've got content providers and in you other mean, words would it be doing violence to the model if we tried to apply it to all all sorts of these nested <coughs> two-sided markets all throughout. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you have to be a bit careful that okay. the, 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 they raise the money the way I say they raise them and, and, yeah. and, and, and so on. But in general, this is a general yeah. platform model yeah, with two-sided things. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, and, uh, and anyway, if you don't like this one, look at the one in the last page because that was a, the one that where, where people actually pay, so they don't have um, a... Yeah. a, a um, they don't have an, an advertising uh, fee. But I think that generally, I mean, when we thought about this model, and, and, we're, and we're not unique, I mean, this, this idea, I mean, maybe not exactly the same model, but this idea is in papers by, by, yeah. um, by Roche and Tirol, by papers by Armstrong and by, by others. But the, the general idea is, 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 is yeah, you're right. It, 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 it goes to many different applications. But I guess in some cases, like the newspaper, where people wonder if the demand is so low that, you know, if they charge mm -hmm. anything, the consumers won't, 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 won't get on, won't, you, won't go to the paper or won't use the platform. Well, I mean, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not so sure. I mean, I, I always worry about, you know, I always wonder why New York Times keeps increasing its price to me. I mean, New York Times has a monopoly in New York, right? A monopoly in the market they're in. The, the other newspapers are a completely different market. It's kind of tabloids and so on. So they have this, this newspaper, and they have increased the price continuously. You know, every, every, every few months, they, they, right now I think it's double of what I was paying a couple of years ago. And it's not obvious to me why they're doing it. You know, what kind of response to what is this? I mean, I think they say, oh, our ad revenue has fallen, therefore we have to give you, give you a higher price. But that's a completely crazy way to, to run a business. Just because you, 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 your demand falls, you keep increasing the price. I mean, that's in, insane. I mean, you know, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but at the same time, whenever I ask people who work in the New York Times, they say, oh, you don't know the worst of it, you know. There are worse things that are happening in the New York Times than you know, so, so don't, don't, don't ask any more questions, <laughs> you know. So, but what I'm saying is that, you know, there, there are, I mean, I would like to be able to apply this to newspapers, and maybe if, if one can find 
a sample of newspapers that are monopolists in, in, in different markets. And there are many cities in the United States in which there is only one newspaper. Yeah. Um, then one can, can, uh, can, yeah. can, can, can test things. Mm -hmm. um, well, they're making so much on advertising that they, the price of buying a newspaper was so far below the price of delivering it that, that uh, the more they deliver, the more they lose. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, but then why are they raising the price? I mean, well, they they want actually low, lowering the num the number of the papers they deliver. They save mo you know money. Like if if every student supposedly at Oxford, every student we educate costs more than we make. <laughs> so <laughs> the better we do. Yeah, but you're not an but but yeah, but that don't we? Yeah, I, I assume Oxford is is not for profit. Yeah. <laughs> really? It's not, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, let me say, I mean, if, if some of you might do econometrics in this. If you're trying to do something like that in econometrics, you have to be careful to, to, to try to isolate this network effect. It's kind of a, a tricky thing to go in different directions. Anyway, that's, I'm, 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 I'm over. No, but that's over great. And, and my hopefully time. you can stay around for a little yeah, while. Yeah, I'll, be, I'll be happy to. Yeah. But anyway, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me here.